And let's turn in our Bibles now to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 22. The closest fellowship, relationship, the most intimate relationship that we can experience is that of marriage. The relationship of husband and wife. God said concerning marriage that the two shall become one flesh. I don't know how you can become any closer than that. Now, whether the one flesh refers to the actual act of cohabitation or is the fruit of the cohabitation, I do not know. It is true that your child is one flesh of both of you. Half of its genes come from each partner so that the one is a composite of the two. Of course, that should silence forever that business of, look what your kid's doing now. (laughs) Because we share equally in the responsibility of the production of that child and it shares the 23 chromosomes from you and the 23 chromosomes from your partner. The second thing that is said concerning marriage, the relationship of marriage, was said by Adam concerning Eve. He said, This is now bone of my bone flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, in the King James translation of the Hebrew word tesla, it translates it as rib. Two times in the Old Testament, this word tesla is translated rib. The word means beams. And thus the idea of a rib as a part of the beams or superstructure of the skeleton of the body. But 19 times, several times it is translated beams, 19 times and the majority of times, this word tisla is translated side. So that could very well read that out of his side God took Eve. But in looking at her, he said, You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She was taken out of man. Dr. Wilson, back in the 40s, A medical doctor wrote an interesting book, God and You, Wonders of the Human Body. And in this book, he takes the position that the tisla out of his side is actually referring to a blood transfusion. It was his premise that God formed Eve and then put Adam into a deep sleep and transfused the life of the flesh, Adam's blood, into Eve and thus she was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. An interesting speculation, not without merit. If we wanted to accept the alternative which to me is intellectually 
unacceptable, we would have to somehow explain how that both sexes evolved to the same degree of maturity and development at the same time coming up the evolutionary scale. And that would be quite a miracle in itself because of the diversities that do exist. And so the evolutionists are hard-pressed to describe the different sexes uh, because it does actually demand two series of absolutely beyond any possibility development of cells into both male and female at the same time so that there could be that relationship that produces the offspring. Now, because the marriage relationship is the closest and the most intimate relationship possible for man, where the two actually become one flesh, where they become a part of each other. Because that is such a close and intimate relationship, the Lord uses it as a symbol of His relationship to the church. And so... The scripture speaks of how we have become one with him. Verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother that shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Paul said, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That glorious unity uniting of our lives with His. Jesus said to His disciples the night in which He was betrayed and they were troubled in heart, In that day you shall know that I am in the Father and you are in Me and I in you. That beautiful, inseparable relationship with Jesus Christ, to which He has brought us by His love. In the 17th chapter of John, Jesus prayed, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made complete in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Writing to the Galatians, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This further symbol of marriage, or male and female, the idea of Eve being taken out of Adam's side, the reason why I like Dr. Wilson's suggestion that the word should be translated side rather than rib and his suggestion that it possibly referred to a blood transfusion. I like that because the symbolism of the church actually taken out of the side of Jesus 
when the spear pierced him and there came forth the blood and water through that blood that Jesus shed there came the life for the church and so our life comes from him and we are bone of his bone flesh of his flesh marriage is a product of love and Jesus loves us we are drawn by his love to a union through that love into a oneness with him drawing our life from him so Paul is drawing here the parallels showing the symbolisms between a marriage of a man and a woman and likening that relationship, that intimate, close relationship to the relationship of Jesus and the church. It's interesting that the Lord desires that kind of intimacy with you. Now, in the Old Testament, we find that this same symbolism is used to describe the relationship of God with Israel. Many times the Lord referred to Israel as His wife. Unfortunately, many times it was as His faithless wife his adulterous wife. The book of Hosea begins with the command of the Lord for Hosea to take a prostitute as his wife. And how that he went in unto her and she bore a child, a second child. But the third child that she bore, he disclaimed. He said, it's not my child. And now his wife then left him and went out and became a prostitute until her life was wasted. She was uh, on the street. She was totally destitute. Her body had been ruined by her promiscuous sex. And God said to Hosea, because at this point she was just selling herself to eat, God said, go purchase her. Take her again as your wife. Clean her up. And then God began to speak of his relationship with the nation of Israel. How he espoused her, married her, but how she committed fornication went after the other gods and uh, and was in love with these other gods and all until she was made destitute. And of course, God promised that He was going to take her back again. He was going to wash her. He was going to cleanse her. And she would again be His wife. Isaiah wrote, For thy Maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken and neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, which means my delight is in her, and thy land Beulah, which means married, for he interprets for us, for the Lord delights in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall my sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. So it was used in the Old Testament to show the 
relationship of God with the nation of Israel. But in the New Testament, it is used to show the relationship of Christ and His church. So as we look in these series of instructions that Paul gave to the church in Ephesus concerning marriage relationships, we see how that all the way through he is liking in it to the relationship of Christ with his church, that relationship of a husband with his wife. Verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. In verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You see, all the way through, he's liking it to the relationship of Christ and the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let, the hus- so let the wives be to their own husbands. And then <clears throat> he said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and we are to give ourselves for them. I think that is such an important thing to realize that as the husband I'm to give myself for her. To love her so much that I'm willing to give myself for her. Now, He tells us that Christ gave himself for the church that he might sanctify it with the washing of the water by the word. And then he goes on to say that he might present it to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. So again, this relationship, Christ and the church, husband and his wife, Christ gave himself for the church to set it apart with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In Jude The final verse is there. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I love that. One day Jesus is going to present me to the Father. And as he presents me to the Father, faultless without spot or blemish or any such thing. That's the glorious future for the bride of Christ, the church. Being presented to the Father. Father, here is my bride, my beautiful bride. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I've espoused is that time beyond engagement but before marriage. Mary was espoused to Joseph. They had not yet come together. They had not... Uh, gone into the conjugal tent and consummated the marriage. But I've espoused you to Christ that I might present you at that day of the marriage as a chaste virgin. In Psalm 45, 
The psalmist draws a very beautiful picture prophetically of the Messiah with his bride. Psalm 45 is recognized as one of the messianic psalms or a psalm that is a prophecy of the Messiah. In the first six verses of the psalm, it speaks of the glory of the bride. I mean the glory of the groom, the king. But then in verse 7 it begins to speak of the bride. And declaring, the king declaring to the bride, Thou lovest righteousness, you hate wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in the gold of Ophir. And now to the bride, hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people in thy father's house. And so shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord. Worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought, and they shall enter into the king's palace. And so the same idea of the beautiful garments of the bride, as Paul said, not clothed with my own righteousness which is of the law, but the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith. As the book of Revelation speaks of the marriage supper of the Lamb, how the bride hath made herself ready, clothed in white linen, fine and pure, for the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. So the king's daughter, all glorious within, And the king greatly desiring her beauty and her commandment is to worship him. Paul writing to the Colossians said, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The Song of Solomon is looked upon by many as the song of the groom with his bride. And there are many who see in the Song of Solomon the song of Christ and the church. They look upon it as a spiritual allegory. And in so doing, it becomes a very beautiful bit of literature indeed, inspirational. And it is interesting in in light of Psalm 45, in Song of Solomon 4, 7, where the groom says, Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. As Paul the Apostle speaks of the glorious church not having spot or wrinkle. Now finally... Paul declares that this unity between the husband and wife is a great mystery because Paul said, I'm speaking of Christ and his church. If you women want to know the kind of relationship that God would have you to have with his, with 
your husband, then study the relationship that God wants between the church and Jesus Christ. And you'll understand your relationship and your role to the husband. Husbands, if you want to know the God-ordained relationship to your wife, then study the relationship of Jesus Christ with His church, who loved His church so much that He laid down His life for the church. He gave Himself for it. That is complete love. He held nothing back. That is self-sacrificing love. He gave himself for his church. That's the kind of love God desires that you should have for your wife. Total, complete, giving, self-sacrificing. There you have the ideal marriage, God's ideal for marriage. And when marriage follows the pattern and uses the relationship of Christ with His church as its example, marriage is heaven. And the closest thing to heaven you'll experience on earth. And it'll draw you into that spiritual dimension which God intends it to do. To change or twist the relationships. It creates havoc. You are no longer following God's order. And you're on the path to misery and disaster. God has given us the divine pattern for the husband through Jesus Christ and his relationship to the church. Through the church, the wife, her relationship to her husband patterned after the relationship of the Christ, of the church unto Jesus Christ. Marriage at its best when following God's ordained plan. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you have set for us your divine order for relationship, for a beautiful, loving, exciting relationship and Lord we thank you for the excitement and the beauty of that relationship when we follow the commands of Jesus Christ what a blessing what a joy how marvelous is marital love Lord, we realize that there are times when we fail to be all that you would have us to be. And in those times, we see how things begin to go awry. Lord, we ask that you would help us. Help us as husbands, Lord to follow the example of Jesus Christ in that self-sacrificing love. Make, Lord, our relationships in the home God-honoring and an example to the world of Jesus and His church. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next week, as we continue on, we hit the kids. And the proper relationship between the child and the parent. You might want to bring your children, (laughs) the older ones, say above 13, 12, 13. You might bring them in and let them hear what God's Word has to say about the relationship of the children to the parents. God's divine order for the family. Shall we stand? May the Lord watch over you, keep you in His love, fill you with His grace, and just cause your heart to overflow with His blessings, His goodness, His love. May the Lord keep you in your way. In Jesus' name.